And I'm really curious about the turnaround, how small at that time, even if you don't think it ever did, because when things have become separated from the whole group, uh, I can't keep up with them. And you can ask the members of this class what, about what happens with an incomplete And then I'm at the very end of the hall, 101, and there's a plastic box outside my office door. And papers will be picked up at 7.15, so be sure you get them in on time. Now, please do not email your paper to me because that's hard for me to keep up with also. And you may email me for comments or advice or just to chat, but don't send your paper to me, please, by email. We will not have a class meeting next time. On April 13th, that is, no class meeting. Our next meeting will be April 20th, at which time we'll do the first third of Tolstoy's Anna Karenina, which will be quite a change for you, and you may be pleasantly surprised because I think it's Tolstoy's easier reading than Dostoevsky. Now, the Brothers Karamazov is the best example I know for distinguishing between what I call form and the structure of a novel. Form is really a, a metaphysical term. We could say that it's the soul of the novel. Jacques Maritain says, form has to do not with conceptual clarity, but with ontological splendor, the splendor of being. And I've always called form the embodiment of insight. So that insight that an author has, if he's a real author, a real poet, That insight in his imagination attempts to take on form. And I think this is the struggle that Dostoevsky had, was trying to match that inner form that he intuited with the structure of the novel. In fact, he said one time that there are two, there are two operations that the writer goes through. He said there's first the vision of the work, which he says is the poem, and I'm calling that the form. And then he says there is the structure of the work, which as an artist he must make. So we might say that the form Brothers Kalmasa has to do with that scriptural passage. Unless a grain of wheat fall to the earth and die, it abideth alone. So the whole novel is a vision of the implications of that 
inside. And it has organic form. It has grown in the writer's imagination like something organic. And he's not entirely in control of it. Now that's what Coleridge calls the primary imagination. And Coleridge, you may remember, says that it's the echo in the finite mind of the infinite I am. The primary imagination is the echo in the finite mind of the infinite I am. So he's really saying it's about being too, you see. And then Coleridge goes ahead to say that the secondary imagination is a matter of making the, the artist in the poet comes out so that he must make something. And so I think this was what, you know, we talked about Dostoevsky having so much trouble writing, rewriting the idiot 11 times uh, and starting over with different plots and different characters. And I think it was trying to match that inner vision, the form, with the structure. Now we ought to begin having a sense of the novel, this novel, as existing in between the decaying corpses of two old men. I would say this is the structure of it. That is, Fyodor, the corrupt, worldly, sinful past of Russia, and Zosima, the holy, joyous, and loving Christian inheritance. So you can see that in the structure of the novel, what it's concerned with is what is the future of Russia? What is the future of mankind? Are we going to go the way of Fyodor, which is corrupt, fallible, sinful? Are we going to go the way of, Rus of Zosima, which is that holy Russia? Now, between these two old men stands Ivan's old man, the new idea, an abstraction, the grand inquisitor. He's proposing that as our inheritance. Neither Zosima nor Fyodor, but the grand inquisitor, a father who protects his weak children by deception and tyranny and who gives them bread in order to take away their freedom. Now, my hope is that our study of this novel will fix its image for you permanently so that it becomes one of your resources, one of your reference points in life, as it certainly has been for me. Now, let's pick up with Dimitri. We've talked about uh, Yosha's falling to the earth and dying. Now let's look at D Dimitri, the eldest of the brothers. We've already come to know his dilemma through his conversation with Alyosha. He's passionate, tempestuous, loving, and impetuous. He adores Grushenka, but he's in honor bound to Katharina. He's in debt to Katharina, and his honor will not allow him to shirk the payment of that debt. He is, in a word, in an intolerable mm -hmm. situation for a turbulent heart. And because he cannot solve his problems himself, he has to tell himself that a miracle will solve it. So Dmitri <coughs> keeps hoping for a miracle and that he and Grushenka will somehow be able to live happily ever after. Like his other brothers, he too is under an illusion. You remember we said Alyosha was under the illusion that saving the world would be easy if people would just follow Fazosima and that that was going to happen very easily because he's untried, he's naive, he's good, he's full of grace, but he has to be broken, as we all do. Now in this final section of the novel, we find that Dmitri has been humiliated by being arrested like a common criminal. 
His word is not believed. Gentlemen, I did not murder my father, he says. He's treated insultingly. He's asked about his story. He tells of a habitual dream in which a dark being pursues him. This is on page 444, tracking him, someone of whom he's awfully afraid. And we recognize his description as the devil. But then he declares that in the garden that evening, when he had intended to kill his father, someone or something, his good angel, saved him. And so in this novel, we can imagine that the influence of that, of his mother, or the influence of Ayosha, but something saves Dimitri from killing his father. He says, whether it was someone's tears, or my mother prayed to God, or a good angel kissed me, I don't know, but the devil was conquered at that moment. He runs from the window, encounters old Gregory, strikes out at him without meaning to hurt him, finds that he is apparently bashed in his skull. He remembers bending over him and wiping the old man's head with his handkerchief. And later, someone murders old Karamazov, the father that Dmitri was intending to attack. So actually striking Gregory keeps him, you see, from killing his father. Later, the police obviously believe that Dmitri is the murderer of his father. He's undressed, put in a cell where he falls asleep and has what he calls a good dream. Now, he dreams of the dreary plains, the steppe that he had traveled over just that day. You remember he was talking so wildly to the driver that it frightened the driver. And now in the dream, which is on page 479, he sees starving, unhappy people standing outside their burned villages. One mother is holding a crying baby. Why are they crying, he asks in the dream. It's the babe, answered the driver. The babe, weeping. But why is the babe weeping, Mitya asks. The babe's cold. The little clothes are frozen and don't warm it. But why is it? Why? Foolish Mitya still persisted. Why, they're poor people, burned out. They've no bread. They're begging because they've been burned out. No, no, Mitya still did not understand. Why is the babe poor? Why is the step barren? Why don't they hug each other? and kiss? Why don't they sing songs of joy? Why are they so dark from black misery? Why don't they feed the babe? So all these naive questions that he's asking in his dream, it's the first time he's ever <coughs> thought that anyone could be without food, without enough money, to live on without enough money to get by, with nothing to eat, nothing to feed the babe. So when he awakens, his heart has been deeply touched by his dream. He finds that someone has placed a pillow under his head while he was sleeping on the hard bench. And he's ecstatic. Who put that pillow under my head? Who was so kind, he asks in a sort of ecstatic gratitude, as though some great kindness had been shown him. He goes to the table and says that he would sign whatever they liked. I've had a good dream, gentlemen, he said in a strange voice, with a new light and a joy in his face. Now, this too, like Ayosha's conversion, like his, like Ayosha's death, to that romantic self that he was, this seemed very minor, a dream, a dream of a hungry baby. But he's never thought to himself that there could be hungry people. He's never dreamed that he could have any responsibility for the poor. Why don't they feed the babe? You know, he's, he, 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 isn't there enough food to feed the child? No, the mother 
was hungry. She has no milk because they live in poverty. They live in destitution. So he's had a good drilling, he says. Now this is meant to be tender and kind of funny, you know, because to call it a good dream, when it's a dream of such destitution, but it has changed his heart. And so this seems a minor thing to mark a turning point in someone's life. But Dimitri has always lived by his passions. He has an ecstatic nature, but before now, he's been given over to sensuality. His long conversation with Alyosha was about beauty, but as he said, there are two kinds of beauty, and one is the beauty of Sodom. Man is too broad, he had declared. I would have him narrower. And so the dream of the hungry child has awakened his soul. It has come to him, as such profound changes must, in a non-rational medium. See, we really cannot change our hearts by thinking. People can prove to us that we're wrong intellectually, but that doesn't change us. And so somehow the changes that make a difference to us have to come to us in a non-rational means, by an image, by a sound, by a touch. He knows himself to be deeply responsible for the crying babe of the dream. He's lived selfishly and thoughtlessly. He'll be a different kind of person after this. And the dream is crowned then by the small anonymous gift that someone gave him of placing a pillow under his head. So his heart overflows. I've had a good dream, gentlemen. Compare the way Dmitri responds with Ivan's reaction about children, the suffering of children. What it has done to Ivan is harden his heart. It's turned him against God because of his terrible fact. And Dimitri, in contrast, falls to the ground in self-abasement. Remember the mantra that Zosima's brother, Markel, had said over and over again, each is responsible for all. If we had all been better, everyone would be happier, the world would not be in the terrible condition it's in. Dimitri, with his generous spirit, his passionate heart, is willing to accept his blame for the suffering in the world. Now, of course, we don't mean that legally we're uh, responsible for all the bad in the world. And of course, we don't mean it quite on the literal level. But we do know that all is tied up together and at the fluttering of a butterfly's wing, as someone has shown, can start a tornado across the world in another part of the world. And so in a tiny way, each of us, Dostoevsky makes us see each of us can change things. And therefore, when we don't change them for the good, when we don't change them by our love, we're to blame for the suffering of the world. But Dmitri is accused of his father's murder and placed in prison then awaiting trial. Now Alyosha will encounter an actual suffering child, the little dying boy, Elusha. So think about the three brothers and their encounter with suffering children. The little boy, Elusha, is sick with tuberculosis, sick with having been hit in the chest by a rock thrown by the other boys. He's sick with shame over his father's humiliation. Dmitri has pulled, had pulled his father's beard in public, indignant over some money that the captain had not delivered for him. And the little boy is so ashamed and then gets into bad relations with his friends and throws a rock and then they throw rocks back and hit him in the chest. Now, one of the remarkable aspects of the Brothers Karamazov is the way in which Dostoevsky incorporates in his novel long prose passages that make up virtually distinct documents. 
and exhibit entirely different styles and modes of thought. We've already looked at the Grand Inquisitor section, and we've looked at Adyosha's account of Father Zosima's life and teachings. And now we have Dimitri's trial. Now these separate works in themselves seem strange incorporated into the novel, but each one, as you see, is told by one of the brothers, or it focuses on one of the brothers. Each has its own rhetoric. Each seems complete, and yet each plays a functional part in the structure of the novel. Ivan's dialogue with his devil is another such long section, employing, as the others do, its own style and its rhetoric, requiring considerable interpretation. Now let's look at Ivan's ordeal. His first visit to Smerdyakov. Smerdyakov is ill and in the hospital. Smerdyakov plays innocent, yet he utters insinuations that trouble Ivan. And on the second visit, Smerdyakov has been discharged from the hospital. But on page 581, Smerdyakov implies a sense of collusion that irritates Ivan. You know, he implies a guilt on the part of Ivan. Page 582, Smerdyakov says it was you who murdered him. And on page 583, Smerdyakov says, you said to me, in effect, you can murder my parent. I won't hinder you. Now this, of course, annoys and troubles Yvonne tremendously. And in between the second and third visit, Yvonne talks to Katerina and sees the incriminating letter from Dmitri on page 585 and 6. And so he's convinced that Dmitri killed the old man. Now let's look at that letter from Dmitri. It starts out, Fatal Katya, tomorrow I will get the money and repay your 3,000 and farewell, woman of great wrath, but farewell too, my love. Let us make an end. Tomorrow I shall try and get it from everyone, and if I can't borrow it, I give you my word of honor. I shall go to my father and break his skull and take the money from under the pillow if only Ivan has gone. If I have to go to Siberia for it, I'll give you back your 3,000 and farewell. I bow down to the ground before you, for I've been a scoundrel to you. Forgive me. No, better not forgive me. You'll be happier, and so shall I. Better Siberia than your love, for I love another woman. And you got to know her too well today, so how can you forgive? I'll murder the man who's robbed me. I'll leave you all and go to the east so as to see no one again. Not her either, for you're not my only tormentress. She is too. Farewell. Well, it certainly sounds like an admission of guilt, doesn't it? And so Ivan is pretty certain that his brother Dmitri did kill their father. But on the third visit to Smerdyakov, which begins on page 583, Ivan suddenly comes upon a solitary drunken little peasant. He was wearing a coarse and patched coat and was walking in zigzags, grumbling and swearing to himself. And then suddenly he would begin singing in a husky, drunken voice, Ach, Vanka's gone to Petersburg. I won't wait till he comes back. But he broke off every time at the second line and began swearing again. And then he would begin the same song again, Vanka's gone to Petersburg. I won't wait till he comes back. Ivan felt an intense hatred for him before he had thought about him at all. Suddenly he realized his presence and felt an irresistible impulse to knock him down. At that moment they met, and the peasant with a violent lurch fell full tilt against Ivan 
who pushed him back furiously. The peasant went flying backwards and fell like a log on the frozen ground. He uttered one plaintive, oh, ah, and then was silent. Ivan stepped up to him. He was lying on his back without movement or consciousness. He will be frozen, thought Ivan. And he went on his way to Smerdyakov. Now Smerdyakov was not in the least scared. He only riveted his eyes on Ivan with insane hatred. Well, it was you who murdered him, if that's it, he whispered furiously. Ivan sank back on his chair as though pondering something. He laughed malignantly. You mean my going away, what you talked about last time? You stood before me last time and understood it all, and you understand it now. All I understand is that you're mad. Aren't you tired of it? Here we are face to face. What's the use of going on keeping up a farce to each other? Are you still trying to throw it all on me to my face? You murdered him. Now this is Smerdyakov speaking. You are the real murderer. I was only your instrument, your faithful servant, and it was following your words I did it. Did it? Why, did you murder him? Ivan turned cold. See, he hasn't really thought that Smerdyakov murdered him. He's been so sure that his brother Dmitri did. Something seemed to give way in his brain and he shuddered all over with a cold shiver. And then Smerdyakov himself looked at him wonderingly. Probably the genuineness of Ivan's horror struck him. You don't mean to say you really did not know? He faltered mistrustfully, looking with a forced smile into his eyes. Ivan still gazed at him <coughs> and seemed unable to speak. Ah, Vodka's gone to Petersburg. I won't wait till he comes back. Suddenly echoed in his head because he had gone to Petersburg as though he were clearing the way for Smerdyakov to murder his father. Do you know I'm afraid that you're a dream, a phantom sitting before me, he muttered. There's no phantom here, Smerdyakov says, but only us two and one other. No doubt he is here, that third between us. Who is he? Who is here? What third person? Ivan cried in alarm, looking about him, his eyes hastily searching in every corner. That third is God, Smerdyakov says. Now, we expected him to say the devil. So we need to think about that. Why would Smerdyakov, who is really an atheist, why would he say that third is God himself? Providence. He is the third beside us now. Only don't look for him. You won't find him. It's a lie that you killed him, Ivan cried madly. You're mad or teasing me again. And Smerdyakov, as before, watched him curiously with no sign of fear. He could still scarcely get over his incredulity. He still fancied that Yvonne knew everything and was trying to throw it all on him to his face. Wait a minute, he said at last in a weak voice, and suddenly bringing up his left leg from under the table, he began turning up his trouser leg. He was wearing long white stockings and slippers. Now every detail about Smerdyakov is somehow repellent. You know, these long white stockings Suddenly he took off his garter and fumbled at the bottom of his stocking. Ivan gazed at him and suddenly shuddered in a paroxysm of terror. He's mad, he cried. And rapidly jumping up, he drew back so that he knocked his back against the wall and stood up against it, stiff and straight. He looked with insane terror at Smerdyakov, who, entirely unaffected by his terror, continued fumbling in his stocking as though he were making an effort to get hold of something with his fingers and pull it out. At last he got hold of it and began pulling it out. Yvonne saw that it was a piece of paper or perhaps a roll of papers. Smerdyakov pulled it out and laid it on the table. 
here, he said. What is it? asked Yvonne, trembling. Kindly look at it, Smerdyakov answered, still in the same low tone. Yvonne stepped up to the table, took up the roll of paper, and began unfolding it, but suddenly drew back his fingers as though from contact with a loathsome reptile. Your hands keep twitching, observed Smerdyakov, and he deliberately unfolded the bundle himself. Under the wrapper were three pa packets of hundred ruble notes. They're all here, all the 3,000 rubles. You need not count them. Take them, Smerdyakov suggested. Nodding at the notes, Ivan sank back in his chair. He was as white as a handkerchief. You frightened me with your stocking, he said, with a strange grin. Can you really not have known till now? Smerdyakov asked once more. No, I did not know. I kept thinking of Dmitri. Brother, brother. Now, he's not calling Smerdyakov brother. He's speaking of Dmitri. Ah, he suddenly clutched his head in both hands. Listen, did you kill him alone? With my brother's help or without? It was only with you, with your help. I killed him. And Dmitri Fyodorovich is quite innocent. All right, all right, talk about me later. Why do I keep on trembling? I can't speak properly. You were bold enough then. You said everything was lawful. And how frightened you are now. Smerdyakov muttered in surprise. Won't you have some lemonade? I'll ask for some at once. It's very refreshing, only I must hide this first. And again he motioned at the notes. He first took out the handkerchief, and as it turned out to be very dirty, took up the big yellow book that Ivan had noticed at first lying on the table and put it over the notes. The book was the sayings of the Holy Father Isaac, the Syrian. Now it's strange that Smerdyakov would be reading a holy book. I never have over the years teaching this novel. I never have entirely understood that. Or I guess I don't understand it at all. Because we know we, we're going to find out in, in just a short while that Smerdyakov will commit suicide. And we know that he is a non-believer. That he is extremely cynical. We know that he is lost. Dostoevsky takes great pains to show us that. So why is he reading the sayings of the Holy Father, Isaac the Syrian? Why did he say, we're alone in this room except for a third? It's God himself. And then he says, it's providence. So has he come to believe? And is he in despair? It seems very enigmatic and strange. And so I think we simply have to hold that uh, in abeyance as we do many other things in this novel. This novel that embraces all of the strange aspects, not only of the world and nature, but of human minds. The human mind, it shows us, is such a strange and contradictory thing. Now, Ivan, of course, is horrified. And he determines that they will go together to the trial. On page 598, he says, we'll go together. Now, on page 600, going back, he comes across the little peasant in the snow. Look on page 600. The snow had almost covered his face. Ivan seized him and lifted him in his arms. Seeing a light in the little house to the right, he went up, knocked at the shutters, and asked the man to whom the house belonged to help him carry the peasant to the police station, promising him three rubles. The man got ready and came out. I won't describe in detail, the narrator says, how Ivan succeeded in his object, bringing the peasant to the police station and arranging for a doctor to see him at once, providing with a liberal hand for the expenses. So we're having the parable of the Good Samaritan repeated here. And I think Dostoevsky 
and duplicates many of the details on purpose to remind us of that. And it's Yvonne, you know, who is acting out this parable of the Good Samaritan. And the narrator says, I won't describe in detail how Ivan succeeded in his object, bringing the peasant to the police station and arranging for a doctor to see him at once, providing with a liberal hand for the expenses. I will only say that this business took a whole hour. But Ivan was well content with it. His mind wandered and worked incessantly. If I had not taken my decision so firmly for tomorrow, he reflected with satisfaction. See, now is that the right attitude for him to have? I should not have stayed a whole hour to look after the peasant, but should have passed by without caring about his being frozen. I'm quite capable of watching myself. By the way, he thought at the same instant with still greater satisfaction although they have decided that I'm going out of my mind. So he's congratulating himself on his good deed, and he's congratulating himself on his clear thinking at the same time. But nevertheless, it is a turn for Yvonne, even if he congratulates himself. Because the earlier Yvonne knocked the peasant down, and went on and would have returned the same way and paid no attention. The Yvonne of all the abstraction that we've known before has had no contact with real human beings. And so this is the beginning of a change. Now, as he entered his own room, he felt something like a touch of ice on his heart like a recollection, or more exactly, a reminder of something agonizing and revolting that was in that room now, at that moment, and had been there before. He sank wearily on his sofa. The old woman brought him a samovar. He made tea, but did not touch it. He sat on the sofa and felt giddy. He felt that he was ill and helpless. He was beginning to drop asleep, but he got up uneasily and walked across the room to shake off his drowsiness. At moments, he fancied he was delirious, but it was not illness that he thought of most. Sitting down again, he began looking round. Now notice how Dostoevsky handles point of view here. He began looking around as though searching for something. This happened several times. At last, his eyes were fastened intently on one point. Yvonne smiled, but an angry flush suffused his face. He sat a long time in his place, his head propped on both arms, though he looked sidewise at the same point, at the sofa that stood against the opposite wall. So he has come in with a great deal of unease in this room, and he looks around the room as though he's looking for something. And finally, he looks at one particular point, and he smiles because he sees something there, but also an angry flush suffuses his face. And so he looks sideways at the same point, at the sofa that stood against the opposite wall. There was evidently something, some object that irritated him there, worried him, and tormented him. Now, all of this has been external to Yvonne. You see, we, we're not seeing through his eyes at, at this point. And then beginning chapter 9, the narrator says, I'm not a doctor. But yet I feel that the moment has come when I must inevitably give the reader some account of the nature of Yvonne's illness. Anticipating events, I can say at least one thing. He was at that moment on the very eve of an attack of brain fever. Though his health had long been affected, it had offered a stubborn resistance to the fever, which in the end gained complete mastery over it. Though I knew nothing of medicine, 
though I know nothing of medicine. I venture to hazard the suggestion that he really had, perhaps, by a terrible effort of will, succeeded in delaying the attack for a time, hoping, of course, to check it completely. He knew that he was unwell, but he loathed the thought of being ill at that fatal time, at the approaching crisis in his life, when he needed to have all his wits about him, to say what he had to say boldly and resolutely, and to justify himself to himself. So he's thinking about his appearance at the trial and the way in which that will justify himself. He had, however, consulted the new doctor who had been brought from Moscow by a fantastic notion of Katerina Ivanovna's, to which I've referred already. After listening to him and examining, the doctor came to the conclusion that he was actually suffering from some disorder of the brain and was not at all surprised by an admission which Yvonne had reluctantly made him. Hallucinations are quite likely in your condition, the doctor opined, though it would be better to verify them. You must take steps at once without moment, a moment's delay, or things will go badly with you. But Yvonne did not follow this judicious advice and did not take to his bed to be nursed. I'm walking about so I'm strong enough. If I drop, it'll be different then. Anyone may nurse me who likes, he decided, dismissing the subject. Now, we know that there's an ambiguity in a doctor's diagnosis. You know, and so the doctor has told him that he has a disorder of the brain. And all of this, the narrator is giving us so that we may think of Yvonne's visitor, if we choose, as just the product of a disordered brain. But there's enough ambiguity in all of this that we have to take it seriously. We have to believe, with one part of our mind at least, that there really is somebody or something in that room. So let's go on to the conversation with the visitor. Yvonne says, I sometimes don't see you and don't even hear your voice as I did last time. So you see, we know he's had this kind of experience before. But I always guess what you're prating, for it's I. I'm myself speaking, not you. So he's saying no matter what you seem to be pretending, you are really just giving me back my own words. And so it's myself speaking. Mm -hmm. It's not any kind of supernatural visitor. Only I don't know whether I was dreaming last time or whether I really saw you. I'll wet a towel and put it on my head, and perhaps you'll vanish into air. And Yvonne went into the corner, took a towel, and did as he said, and with a wet towel on his head, began walking up and down the room. I'm so glad you treat me so familiarly, the visitor began. Now, as the two talk, Yvonne becomes aware that the visitor is giving him back his own sayings, his own theories, but in such a way that Yvonne can tell how tawdry they are, whereas he has prided himself on their brilliance. He becomes more and more agitated at the strange Prince of Darkness, who, as Dostoevsky shows us, is tacky and plausible. He is an embodiment of Pashlost, you know, of the Gogolian kind of Pashlost, pleasant and mediocre. Now, those of you who've read C.S. Lewis's Screwtape Letters will recognize this version of the devil, which was no doubt inspired by Dostoevsky, as was Walker Percy's devil in his novel Love in the Ruins. What Dostoevsky makes us see about the force of evil is that it does not operate by tempting people to evil, but to an apparent good. As Ruth Nanda Ashen writes 
in her book, The Reality of the Devil. She says the devil's thesis is simple. His theory is that the history of mankind is his history since the fall of Adam and Eve. This decision represents the will of God himself, the fallen history of man. So the world belongs to the devil. The devil then does not work primarily by urging people to evil, but to a separate world. And I think this is one of the main things that Dostoevsky makes us see. He urges people to a world dedicated to building the crystal palace. So it looks like a good. Ordinary sin is a very different thing from the kind of evil that the devil inspires. Sin comes of our fallen nature, but it's always capable of being forgiven. Zosima, you remember, says, love a man in his sin, for that is the love that's nearest God's. But evil is a different matter. Dostoevsky makes us see, like most of our theologians, that evil is nothingness. It imitates God. It rivals God. And to win people over, it has to offer an apparent good. So Dostoevsky's view was that the devil offers above all else mediocrity, a safe appearing virtue, a golden age in which people will all be happy and the state will take care of them. Now this has been Ivan's idea, which had sounded to him so noble, but in the mouth of this shabby, mediocre visitor, Yvonne's statements sound banal and even tacky. For Yvonne to hear his own thoughts and his theories expressed by such a cheap, tawdry kind of person, and for them to sound so shallow, is devastating to Yvonne. Now let's look at parts of their conversation. Fool, laughed Yvonne. Do you suppose I should stand on ceremony with you? I'm in good spirits now, though I have a pain in my forehead and in the top of my head. Only please don't talk philosophy as you did last time. If you can't take yourself off, talk of something amusing, talk gossip. You're a poor relation, you ought to talk gossip. What a nightmare to have, but I'm not afraid of you. I'll get the better of you. I won't be taken to a madhouse. And his visitor says, c'est charmant. Poor relation. Yes, I'm in my natural shape. But what am I on earth but a poor relation? See, we're all, he's related to all of us. But he's a poor relation. By the way, I'm listening to you, and I'm rather surprised to find you're actually beginning to take me for something real, not simply your fancy, as you persisted in declaring last time. On page 604, Yvonne says, Never for one minute have I taken you for reality. You're a lie. You're my illness. You're a phantom. It's only that I don't know how to destroy you and I see I must suffer for a time. You are my hallucination. You are the incarnation of myself, but only of one side of me, of my thoughts and feelings, but only the nastiest and stupidest of them. From that point of view, you might be of interest to me, if only I had time to waste on you. Let's see what time it is. And his visitor says, excuse me, excuse me, I'll catch you. When you flew out at Alyosha under the lamppost this evening and shouted to him, you learnt it from him, how do you know that he visits me? You were thinking of me then. So for one brief moment, you did believe that I really exist. The gentleman laughed blandly. And Yvonne says, yes, that was a moment of weakness. But I couldn't believe in you. I don't know whether I was asleep or awake last time. Perhaps I was only dreaming then and didn't see you really at all. 
And why were you so surly with Alyosha just now? He's a dear. I've treated him badly over Father Zosima. So, <laughs> so he admits then that it was he that led Alyosha astray there for a while and could have overcome this young man if it hadn't been for Grushenka. See, if it hadn't been for this woman that we think is sinful or that the world thinks is sinful, you know, Alyosha might have made some, taken some steps, you know, that would have been irrevocable. And Ivan says, don't talk about Yosha. How dare you, you flunky. And Ivan laughed again. And his visitor says, you scold me, but you laugh. That's a good sign. But you're ever so much more polite than you were last time. And I know why. That great resolution of yours. Don't speak of my resolution, cried Ivan savagely. I understand, I understand. C'est noble. C'est charmant. You're going to defend your brother and to sacrifice yourself. Chez Chevaleresque, hold your tongue. I'll kick you. So Yvonne was intending then to defend the brother and sacrifice himself. But this is at a moment of a turning point for him. And his visitor says, I shan't be altogether sorry if you kick me. For then my object will be attained. If you kick me, you must believe in my reality. For people don't kick ghosts. Joking apart, it doesn't matter to me. Scold if you like, though it's better to be a trifle more polite, even to me. Fool. Flunky. What words? Scolding you, I scold myself. Yvonne laughed again. You are myself, myself only with a different face. You just say what I'm thinking, and you're incapable of saying anything new. And his visitor says, if I'm like you in my way of thinking, it's all to my credit. He declared with delicacy and dignity, you choose only my worst thoughts, and what's more, the stupid ones. You are stupid and vulgar. No, wait a minute, this is Yvonne speaking. You choose only my worst thoughts. You're stupid and vulgar. You're awfully stupid. No, I can't put up with you. What am I to do? What am I to do? Yvonne said through his clenched teeth. My dear friend, above all things, I want to behave like a gentleman and to be recognized as such. The visitor began in an access of deprecating and simple-hearted pride, typical of a poor relation. I certainly can't conceive how I can ever have been an angel, he says, if I ever was. So he's saying, I'm not really a fallen angel, as people think. If I ever was, it must have been so long ago that there's no harm in forgetting it. Now, I only prize the reputation of being a gentlemanly person and live as I can, trying to make myself agreeable. I love men genuinely. I've been greatly calumniated. You see, there's a way in which we can say that the devil loves human beings, wants them to have an easy life, wants them to have pleasure, like the Grand Inquisitor, you know, wants to take care of them. So I've been greatly calumniated, he says. Here, when I stay with you from time to time, my life gains a kind of reality. And that's what I like most of all. You see, like you, I suffer from the fantastic and so I love the realism of earth. Now look at that. He says to Yvonne, you and I are alike. You know, we both have what Alan Tate calls the angelic imagination, you know. And when a demon or a human being has the angelic imagination, that's bad, you know, because it's a kind of Gnostic dream of things. It doesn't have any contact with reality. But his visitor, Ivan's visitor, is bright enough, smart enough, to know that it's fantastic. And he loves and desires the realism of Earth. Here with you, he says, everything is circumscribed. Here all is formulated and geometrical. While we have nothing but indeterminate equations, 
I wander about here dreaming. I like dreaming. I wander about here dreaming. I like dreaming. Besides, on earth, I become superstitious. See, so he prefers earth. And on earth, he becomes superstitious. Please don't laugh. That's just what I like, to become superstitious. I adopt all your habits here. I've grown fond of going to the public baths. Would you believe it? And I go and steam myself with merchants and priests. What I dream of is becoming incarnate once for all and irrevocably in the form of some merchant's wife weighing 18 stone. So she would be a pretty heavy woman and of believing all that she believes. My ideal is to go to church and offer a candle in simple-hearted faith. Upon my word, it is. Then there would be an end to my sufferings. I like being doctored, too. In the spring, there was an outbreak of smallpox. And I went and was vaccinated in a founding hospital. If only you knew how I enjoyed myself that day. Fool, Yvonne snapped out. But you're clever anyway. You're scolding again? I didn't ask out of sympathy. You needn't answer. Fool, repeated Ivan. You keep saying the same thing. But I had such an attack of rheumatism last year that I remember it to this day. The devil have rheumatism? Why not, if I sometimes put on fleshly form? I put on fleshly form and I take the consequences. Satan, sum, et nihil humanum, ame alienum puto. I'm Satan and deem nothing human, alien to me. Now he's turned that around from Terence, who says, I'm human. And therefore, nothing human is alien to me. But I'm Satan, and therefore, nothing human is alien to me. And that's chilling, of course. That's not bad for the devil, Yvonne says. I'm glad I pleased you at last. But you didn't get that from me. Yvonne stopped suddenly, seeming struck. That never entered my head. That's strange. All right, so we're given clues back and forth that many of the things that the devil says or that this visitor says are things that Yvonne has said before, but they sound to him now awfully trivial, whereas he had thought they were profound. They sound to him now tacky and sort of secondhand and sentimental. But sometimes this visitor says things that Yvonne didn't say. So he and we are kept on tenderhooks. We don't know whether this is a projection of Yvonne's sick mind or whether it is the devil or a devil. All right, so they go on talking. And Yvonne says, is there a God or not? He cried with the same savage intensity. Ah, oh, then, then you're in earnest. And his visitor says, my dear fellow, upon my word, I don't know. So that's, that's terribly interesting. You see, if we, if we take this man as a fallen angel, he has been so long fallen that he's forgotten. First how he got this way, and he's forgotten anything about the heavenly regions. But some of it comes back to him, as we see later. Upon my word, I don't know. There, I've said it now. You don't know, but you see God? No, you're not someone apart. You're myself. You're I and nothing more. You're rubbish. You're my fancy. And he says, well, if you like. I have the same philosophy as you, that would be true. Je pense, dont je suis. And there is our Cartesian, I think, therefore I am. So this visitor is a rationalist. I know that for a fact. All the rest, all these worlds, God and even Satan, all that's not proved to my mind. Does all that exist of itself? Or is it only an emanation of myself, a logical development of my ego? 
which alone has existed forever. But I make haste to stop, for I believe you'll be jumping up to beat me directly. But then he goes on to tell us that before time was, by some decree which I could never make out, I was predestined to deny. So he is the spirit of negation. And like antimatter, at least he conceives of himself as necessary for existence. We could not have matter without antimatter. I've always wanted scientists to take this passage, this whole thing, seriously. Because there's something very important, I think, that's going on here. He says, and yet I'm genuinely good-hearted and not at all inclined to negation. But they said, no, you must go and deny. I don't like to deny. You know, I'd like to agree as much as anybody else. You know, I'm as, I'm as nice as you are. But they say, no, you must go and deny. Without denial, there's no criticism. And what would a journal be without a column of criticism? Without criticism, it would be nothing but one Hosanna. So he's talking about something that happened in heaven. And that is that time that Milton talks about in Paradise Lost, the elevation of the sun in heaven. And so there has to be hosannas. But there needs to be negation. But nothing but hosanna is not enough for life. The hosanna must be tried in the crucible of doubt and so on in the same style. But I don't meddle in that. I didn't create it. I'm not answerable for it. Well, they've chosen their scapegoat. They've made me write the column of criticism. And so life was made possible. We understand that comedy. I, for instance, simply ask for annihilation. No, live, I'm told. For there's be nothing without you. If everything in the universe were sensible, nothing would happen. There would be no events without you. And there must be events. So against the grain, I serve to produce events and do what's irrational because I'm commanded to. So don't blame me. You see, I tried to get out of it. But they said, no, you have to be negative. You have to deny. For all their indisputable intelligence, men take this farce as something serious. And that is their tragedy. They suffer, of course, but then they live. They have a real life. And then he goes on, it's generally accepted in society that I'm a fallen angel. I certainly can't conceive how I could ever have been an angel. All right, go on over. And Yvonne becomes so angry that he picks up a glass of water and throws it at this phantom or this visitor. And that gives the visitor a great deal of mirth because it's imitating Luther, you know, who is supposed to have thrown a glass of water at, at the devil. And they go on discussing for a long time. The visitor is obviously carried away by his own eloquence, speaking louder and louder and looking ironically at his host. But he didn't succeed in finishing. Yvonne suddenly snatched a glass from the table and flung it at the orator. And so he says he's remembered Luther's inkstand. It's the inkstand that he threw, I'm sorry. He takes me for a dream and throws glasses at a dream. It's like a woman. I suspected you were only pretending to stop up your ears. But after all, that's stupid. A loud, persistent knocking was suddenly heard at the window. Yvonne jumped up from the sofa. Do you hear? You'd better open, cried the visitor. It's your brother, Alyosha, with the most interesting and surprising news, I'll be bound. All right, so he's predicting 
something that Ivan has no way of knowing. You know, it's your brother, Alyosha, and he has interesting and surprising news. Be silent, deceiver. I knew it was Alyosha. I felt he was coming. And of course he has not come for nothing. Of course he brings news, Ivan exclaimed frantically. Open to him. There's a snowstorm and he's your brother. Does the gentleman know the weather he's making? It's not weather for a dog. The knocking continued. <coughs> Ivan wanted to rush to the window, but something seemed to fetter his arms. All right, now this then would seem as though he's awaking from a nightmare, because you know the way you are when you have been dreaming, and you wake up and can't move. So something seemed to fetter his arms and his legs. He strained every effort to break his chains, but in vain. Now, Alyosha brings the news that Smerdyakov has hanged himself. And in court on the following day, Ivan has a breakdown and develops fully the brain fever with which his part of the novel ends. Now, Dostoevsky had shown us the workings of the demonic in his preceding novel, The Devils. But those were petty devils, a swarm of them, led by Peter, a kind of malicious imp. In The Brothers, his depiction is more profound. The traditional belief about the devil is that he's a fallen angel, a spiritual being who has all the attributes of an angel, but who has turned away from God in pride in an attempt to set up his own order, a counter world, we might say. He has tempted man so that he fell and lost the garden, and he works with humanity in building civilization. Hence the crystal palace, as we've said, is the work of the devil. And yet, as Jacques Ellul, E-L-L-U-L, has said in his book on the city, he said, though our cities are cursed, the first one was built by the murderer Cain. And you remember, Yahweh never wants his people to found a city. He won't let them found a city. Jerusalem had already been founded and was taken over by the Israelites. But though cities are cursed, they're also blessed. So our work with Lucifer, the rebel, the one who will not accept authority, has a paradoxical quality to it. I remember reading a letter of William Faulkner <coughs> in which he said to someone, we need to be thankful to the devil because he's goaded us into many good works that we otherwise might not have undertaken. Now, Faulkner was not just being shocking, but he was recognizing that humanitarian works, he was recognizing the traditional view that humanitarian works on a large scale, you know, are building toward the Crystal Palace. And yet we have to do good works you know, but we're supposed to do them really personally and one by one, caring about others and not just pitying others as Mishkin does. So the devil's work has a paradoxical quality to it. But if Lucifer wins completely with us, we're inducted into his realm of stagnation, where ultimately, Though it appears glamorous, Lucifer's realm is nothingness, built in imitation of God. It has no energy. It's lukewarm, as we saw in The Devils. It's mediocre. So everything that pulls toward mediocrity, everything that advises mediocrity, is the devil's share. 
Now you might want to read some books on the devil. Uh, C.S. Lewis is a screw tape letters. And then there's the book by Ruth Ashen, A-S-H-E-N, called The Reality of the Devil. There's an interesting book by Denise de Rougemont called The Devil's Share. And then there is a book by a Carmelite priest, Father Bruno, called Satan. But if we think back about what various people have said, it makes us aware that this disguise that, Don T that Dostoevsky is showing us of this devil, who appears as a, a good, ordinary, uh, mediocre person, wanting only people to be happy and content, that that has had some history to it, that a number of people have said such things about the devil. But Baudelaire said the devil's cleverest wile is to convince us that he doesn't exist. And that's what's happened in the modern world, chiefly. De Rougemont, whom I've mentioned to you, says the devil is the absolute anti-model. His precise essence is disguise, the usurpation of appearances, shameless or subtle bluff. In short, the art of making forms lie. The great sham. And this is who Yvonne's devil is. Not the great rebel with thunder and lightning, but the great imposter. Mouthing words, mocking, making fun of things, superior acting, and yet finally being the little guy who isn't there. Saying, upon my word, I don't know. <laughs> What could I do? What I'd like is to be ordinary, like a fat housewife. As de Rougemont says, God says, I am he who is. But the devil, ever jealous of God, bent on imitating him, even though it be in reverse, says to us, my name is nobody. There's nobody. Why should you be afraid of nobody? Are you going to tremble before the non-existent? Now look back at the portrayal of the demonic in literature and look at it the way it has uh, gone. Dante's Satan, you know, stuck deep in ice, unmoving. Milton's Satan, you know, moving like lightning with a sense of injured merit, a leader at the beginning, bold and bright and heroic but stooping to lies and deception and becoming, you know, having to be a, a toad at Eve's ear finally. And then at the end, you remember addressing the fallen angels and opening his mouth to give a heroic speech and only a hiss coming out because he's been transformed finally into a serpent. Think of Dr. Faustus with Mephistopheles. Think of Iago, dark and vicious sharp and ironic with his incessant litany of I hate the moor and he tells us constantly of the evil that he plans to do about Desdemona he says out of her own virtue I'll make the net that shall ensnare them all so he has to have good to work with Shakespeare shows us in Othello he can't do anything without Desdemona's good Yvonne's devil then is plausible and friendly and affable. One of the good guys, mediocre, no vision of anything, trying his best as one of the underlings to do a good turn, tempting to engender a bit of faith in Yvonne and producing only doubt. It's a profound picture of evil in our time. Evil that has to pose as harmless and ordinary and democratic. So Yvonne has found that his dream of building a good and happy society is more difficult than he thought. In the visitor's mouth, it sounds ridiculously idealistic and naive. You can look on page 615 and 616. Yvonne is beginning to see through himself, 
to find the hidden evil within his own heart. He's told himself that his rebellion against God has been for noble reasons, and he's now confronted with the banality, the vulgarity, and the nothingness of evil. He can't bear the insight. This sense of other worlds, which has given Alyosha his vision of Father Zosima at the eternal wedding feast, that has given Marco, Father Zosima's brother, an awareness of a spiritual life so intense that he discerns heaven as being all around us, if we could but see it. This same insight into other worlds is beginning to dawn on Yvonne, but it gives him, in contrast, an insight into the counter force against God. His devil is real. It's also the product of his own mind. And Dostoevsky's indicating this is how things work for human beings. Their minds pick up signals of transcendence. But they also pick up their own thoughts. This is the way the devil works with people. He enters their psyches through the reasoning process, using what we think of as good to blind us. Think of the Pharisees. Think of most reformers. No one begins his turn away from the good by loving evil. Ivan has been following what he has deluded himself is the good. He's now moving toward an understanding of the tawdriness of his own rhetoric, and that hurts him worse than anything because Ivan is intelligent, he's bright, he has good taste. And to see how tawdry and cheap and tacky these ideas are, and how hackneyed. As Alyosha says on page 622, God in whom he disbelieves is gaining mastery over his heart. But as Dostoevsky makes clear, God's mas mastery can be either judgment or love. It's love both ways, but it's according to the will of the soul, the way it's perceived. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, and Iran is in those hands. We do not know how his journey will end. Now, in his portrayal of Ivan's devil, Dostoevsky exhibits an amazing complexity. His contribution to our understanding of evil comes from his uncanny insight into the way the devil works, as well as his prophetic and original understanding of psychology. Among writers, one medical textbook says there has probably never been any who understand the sick psyche so well who was a greater psychologist than Dostoevsky. And psychiatrists such as Freud and Adler, Steckel and Jung have acknowledged Dostoevsky's profound understanding of the paradoxes of the human psyche. Did Yvonne imagine it all, dream it? Is it a hallucination, a nightmare, or did he really have a visitor that evening? Now look at the three brothers and the way in which all three of them have to be righted because they've been on the wrong path. With Dimitri, it's been an actual dream. He dreamed of a hungry baby crying. With Alyosha, it's been a vision, a vision of his beloved elder at the marriage feast, the wedding at Cana at the marriage feast in heaven. And with Yvonne, we could say it's a nightmare or a hallucination. It's something extraordinary. It's not ordinary thought that has to break in upon him, but that carries with it a reality. Dostoevsky implies that this is the way the other world appears to us. It becomes all confused with our thoughts as Keats said, of a happier encounter, was it a vision or a waking dream, he says. Fled is that music. 
do I wake or sleep? The most remarkable features of the brothers Karamazov is the way in which long rhetorical pieces delineate the farthest extension of each brother's vision of reality. We've seen that Father Zosima's long testament, which Alyosha relates to us. You remember, he puts it all together. And that makes clear the way that is to be chosen by Alyosha. And if we had to sum that up, it would be love. Don't judge. Don't seek revenge. Work. Be joyful. Now, such moral and spiritual advice would be virtually platitudinous outside the context of the novel. But where it's in the mouth of someone we have come to revere by seeing his actions you know, and being told to us by Alyosha, it takes on great meaning. Now, Ivan's way, the way of the ironist, the atheistic humanist, is voiced by his devil. It's the way of affable but slightly banal self-interest and irony. It's what nowadays we would call the critical method, the skeptical way. Everything is approached in an exceedingly plausible manner by an amiable and unprepossessing visitor who seeks nothing but our welfare, so he says, and his own incarnation. He wants to be one of us, so to speak. Now, Dimitri's way, the way of the world, of passions and sensuality, of crime and punishment, is incorporated for us by two long rhetorical pieces. The speeches of the prosecutor and the defense attorney at the trial. We might call to mind the trial of Orestes in the court of Athena, you remember, in order to see how far justice has fallen off in modernity, in the age of enlightenment. In that play, the Oresteia, the gods are at stake with Apollo and the Furies to be reconciled by Athena. Whereas here, in Demetrius' trial, a shallow kind of psychology attempts to resolve the things of the soul, with one attorney representing the self-consciousness of a people in seeing themselves in the eyes of the rest of the world, and the other representing the chauvinism that tells the people they're unique and that they should dare to follow their own hearts. So on one side it says, don't care what the rest of the world thinks. You know, you're Russian. The other side says, we better look at what the rest of the world thinks about us, you know, when we make this judgment and how we treat this young criminal, Dmitri. But the actuality is that Dmitri did not murder his father, no matter how the knife of psychology cuts it. So at the trial, on page 623, we have the gossip in the town, with the ladies all for Dimitri and their husbands all against him, because he's good looking. 625, <laughs> page 625, the lawyer for the defense, Pat Yukovich, is a famous man from Petersburg. And Kirillovich is the local prosecutor that people have always laughed at because of his overuse of psychology. On page 627, we have Mitya's entrance. He makes an unfavorable impression, which he continues in his impulsive comments. He breaks out because he's a passionate, uh, impulsive person. On page 628, Hearing of Smerdyakov's death, for instance, he bursts out, he was a dog and died like a dog. But see, that doesn't make a terribly good impression on the court. And then later, he says, I plead, he, I plead guilty to drunkenness and dissipation, to idleness and debauchery, but I'm not guilty of the death of that old man. You see. 
Well, if you're trying to win a case for a, somebody that's accused, uh, you don't want them to witness against their own character in this way. So he's pretty uncontrollable. Now on page 631, we have Gregory's dignified testimony. And he tells us that Dimitri was badly treated as a child and that Fyodor was a bad father. But nevertheless, Gregory really thinks that Dimitri killed his father. The door was open into the garden, he says. And Fetyukovich discredits him. And Dimitri impulsively thanks him. See, he speaks out all the time and says, thank you, thank you, you know, to whoever does anything kind. And then Rakitin's testimony seems enlightened and creates a favorable impression. He's written a pamphlet on the death of Father Zosima, but it's revealed that he took money from Rushinka to bring Alyosha to her, which turns everyone against Rakitin. So everything hinges on Dmitri's possession of 3,000 rubles, the amount said to be in the envelope in Fyodor's possession. So the whole thing is extremely complicated. It's a carnival. You see, we, if you want to see a carnival uh, extended, it's this trial of Dimitri where disorder prevails. Now, Dr. Herzenstube testifies and says, Dimitri was a good boy. I taught him his catechism, and I gave him a pound of nuts. And Dimitri says, thank you, thank you for that pound of nuts. You know, nobody ever gave me a pound of nuts before. And so they can't control Dimitri and keep him from speaking out all the time. Hansen Stuba says he ought to have looked to the left at the ladies when he entered the room. And the Moscow doctor is scornful, says he ought to have looked to the right, to the defense counsel. Now this is all a carnival. And Varvinsky, on the contrary, says Dimitri is normal. He did right in looking straight ahead toward the judges. So they're all trying to psychologize him the whole time. Alyosha's testimony, he believes his brother. And then Grushinka tells the whole story of Dimitri saving her. And Ivan testifies that Smerdyukov killed his father and that it was not Dimitri. But Ivan becomes more and more incoherent and finally breaks down uh, in an attack of brain fever. And Katerina becomes hysterical. So all of that is wild and uncontrolled. It's a travesty of justice. And we're meant to see it as satire and as carnival. Now, at the trial, as we say, there are two long speeches by two lawyers, the one for the defense and the other the prosecuting attorney. Both are fallacious. The prosecutor maintains that we should punish Dmitri to show the world that Russia has high moral standards. And the other one argues that since there was no real father involved, no father was killed. You know, there hasn't been a murder. And Dmitri should be shown mercy. Both use the language of liberal sociology. Dostoevsky works their speeches into his text. Another of his amazing inclusions of total documents, the Grand Inquisitor legend and Father Zosima's sermon on his death day. Dmitri is convicted, even though he's innocent. When we last see him, he's in prison, awaiting his sentence to Siberia and debating whether he should escape, instead escape and go to America. Dostoevsky leaves his destiny open, but Grushinka and he have found that they truly love each other, and whatever he does, she will be with him. Ivan is lying ill. We don't know what will become of him. Alyosha thinks he will recover. And we tend to trust whatever Alyosha says. Alyosha has found his calling with a group of boys centered on a young leader named Kolya. Alyosha has become a grown-up. He can now speak with authority. We're told that he rises from the earth a champion, you remember. He's unified 
all the parts of his being, is he's no longer reliant only upon someone else's testimony. His mind and his heart have come together in a kind of marriage. See, that marriage symbolism goes through the whole novel, the coming together of all of the parts of man and of the universe. We think of the marriage feast at Cana as one of the dominant symbols. He has fallen to the earth. Now, what does the earth signify in this instance, and indeed throughout Dostoevsky's writings? This precious creation, this incarnation of God's idea, the void breathed upon by the Holy Spirit, this substance out of which the human person was created, male and female, those two mysterious compliments, the symbolism of the marriage feast of Cana, bring water and it shall be changed into wine. Bring your human heart and it will be transformed into something holy. So that runs all the way through the novel. There are so many subterranean um, traces of different symbolisms in this novel that if we, we could have of course spent the whole semester on this one novel. But it seems to me better to introduce you to several of the Russian novels so that you have the context in which to place all this. And I hope that you will continue to study this novel in particular the rest of your life, because it seems to me that it is worthy of that. Now, Alyosha is now fully grown up. He's a man. He founds out, finds out the story behind the suffering of the dying boy, Ilusha. It turns out that the boy has been so shamed by the humiliation of his father in public, that he fought with his friends because Dmitri Karamazov pulled the father's beard in the sight of everybody. And it disgraced not only the father, but the son. So in Ilusha's family, Dostoevsky gives us a glimpse of destitution because when the captain has lost his job, there's nowhere to turn. And people are so much aware of the change from the agrarian life to the city, to urban life. And there's nothing to fall back on in urban life if you lose your job. You see, there was community in agrarian life. There was the land. There's nothing. And someday we're all going to be held responsible for all the homeless in our cities. You know, we ignore them now. But the same way that we're passing judgment on people who owned slaves in the past, and many of them were innocent in that they didn't think about it, they didn't mean to be doing something unkind and really sinful and wrong. So it seems to me that we'll, we'll start looking back at the terrible conditions of urbanization, and we'll see that people had nothing to fall back on after their jobs are gone if they don't have a salary. So destitution really was introduced by urbanization. And Dostoevsky is the great writer of urbanization. Poverty is not destitution. See, poverty is actually thought by many at least, at least in the past, to be a desirable thing. It means living simply having only what one needs, the non-acquisitive life. And we all need to live in a spirit of poverty. But destitution is different. So Elisha's father, the captain, has been disgraced and discharged, and his family is destitute. His wife is deranged. One daughter is lame. Elisha is dying of tuberculosis. He had met, been a member of a group of boys of whom Kolya, a 14-year-old, is the leader. Kolya is basically a good boy, but he has to seem to know everything and to be afraid of nothing. Once he declares, you remember, that he will lie down on the, on the train tracks and allow a train to pass over him. And once he said he'll do it, he has to do it. He's scared to death, we can tell. He does the trick but it leaves him pale and shaken. And when his mother finds out she's a widow and he's her only child, 
She becomes hysterical, and for a little while, Kolya reverts to being a child again. They run into each other's arms from time to time during the day with the mother sobbing and making her son promise never to do such a thing again. And so Kolya, for a little while, becomes a little boy again. Kolya soon recovers his braggadocio. He had broken with the sick boy over a cruel trick that Elusha had unwittingly done to a dog. And it was Rakitin, that evil seminarian. We haven't said much about him, but he's just like a dark shadow in all of this. You know, we find him trying to get Alyosha in trouble. We find him uh, doing all sorts of wicked things. And so one of the things that he has done is to convince Elusha to play this trick on a dog of putting a pen in a biscuit and throwing it in a piece of bread and throwing it to the dog. And the dog snapped it up and then runs away yelping. And little Elusha is certain that he's killed the dog. And he grieves. He's already ill, and he grieves. And this has caused the great trouble because the boys know about it, and they shun Elusha. And so he becomes an outcast over this sadistic trick that Rakitin had encouraged. So the boy grieves bitterly over what he's done, and Kolya, who had been his friend, will have nothing to do with him. They begin throwing stones at Elusha, and one heavy stone had hit the boy in his weak chest. Alyosha comes into this situation, and we can see immediately how much he has grown in authority. He likes Kolya, the leader, and even admires him, and yet he does not hesitate to correct him. I've had good papers on comparing Alyosha and Mishkin, and one of the strong points is the w difference in the way Alyosha treats the boys here and the way Mishkin treated children. Because Mishkin treats children as though they are grown-ups completely. Remember he said you can tell them anything, you know. And Alyosha talks to Kolya as though he's an equal, but when it's necessary, he speaks with authority and rebukes him. I think if you go back and look at the conversation between Alyosha and uh, Kolya, you'll find how noble and fine Alyosha is in being able to correct the boy and to tease him even without demeaning him without making him feel um, foolish. So Kolya has found the dog that ran away. And in a, it's terribly wrong what he does, but he doesn't think of it as wrong. He has renamed him and taught him tricks and has waited until the dog has mastered all the tricks before bringing him to Elusha. So here is this dying boy with the grief that he has over having mistreated the dog. And here is Kolya taking time to teach the dog tricks, renaming him and teaching him tricks. Alyosha rebukes Kolya for keeping the dog away so long just to show him off. For Elusha is so ill by now that the joy of seeing the dog again quite overcomes him. Now, earlier in the novel, then, we had encountered Kolya in Book 10, the only son of a doting mother, brought up in a single-parent home with no father to guide his aspirations toward manliness. He's a young man of stout heart and heroic inclinations. He's 13, going on 30 as he acts like He's the boy, we find out, that Elusha had stabbed in the leg with his penknife. And the boys who gather around this natural leader, Kolya, are the ones who threw stones at Elusha. So what we're made to see in this section, dealing with Kolya, is Alyosha's calling as a teacher. This gentle, inexperienced young man is able now to command authority he seems to know that boys have built into their psyches warrior traits. 
That is, they must prove themselves to their fellows. They must show themselves capable of withstanding pain, of doing bold deeds, of defying authority. And they have to have slavish adherents and protégés. So Kolya, an extraordinarily deep and tender-hearted boy and a natural leader, needs to prove himself to his fellows to the dismay of his overprotective mother. Now we're aware of Rakitin's influence on Kolya. He's been teaching him to read Voltaire. He's been teaching him to be a skeptic, to doubt. And we are aware of Kolya's longing to meet Alyosha and yet his fear of meeting him. Now on page 503, when Alyosha first appears to the boys, his appearance has changed. We were told that he fell to the earth a weak boy, but that he rose a resolute champion. And the way he treats Kolya, as I said, is frank and open, not pretending. On page 523, he says, who taught you all this, he says to the boy, because the boy is being skeptical about everything. And the boy says, Voltaire. And then we find out that Rakitin has given him Voltaire to read. But when Alyosha rebukes him, the boy says, well, I haven't read much Voltaire, and I just read him a translation, a poor translation. So he begins backing down and not being quite so boastful. And we begin to see the turning point for Kolya and a kind of remorse and conversion that takes place in Kolya on page 526. So we're aware then that Alyosha is going to be like Father Zosima. He's going to teach. And he's going to teach without making others feel inferior. He's going to teach with that kindness and love that's genuine, that Father Zosima has manifested. And so we have the next generation coming along with a leader in Kolya. Now, in the figure of Captain Snegirov, we have a suffering person that I think illustrates that word that Madame Holokoff had used, lacerations. You know, she's always bringing up a word that's strange and asking about it. Aberration was one of the words. She noticed that it was being used in the newspapers all the time. And so what does aberration mean, she was asking. She's an interesting, strange character. You know, we'd like to just write her off. She's the lady of little faith, you know. And she's Lisa's mother, and Lisa is taken to a wheelchair, no doubt, uh, because of her mother. But nevertheless, she, and she's the one who tells Dimitri to go to the gold mines, that there's plenty of money in the gold mines. So she's silly. But there's something to her, nonetheless. So she asks about that word, lacerations. And we have all sorts of varieties of lacerations then following her bringing up that topic. And some of the lacerations are self-lacerations that are fake. You know, we think of Katerina Ivanovna, uh, who lacerates herself, and we see a number of people who love to make themselves feel bad, but we encounter the real laceration in Captain Snegirov. Now, what laceration is, is that tearing at oneself, you see. And so because he is so ashamed that he can't provide for his family, so ashamed of his public disgrace, and because he loves his family so much and loves his little dying boy so much, he lacerates himself by playing the buffoon. And so we're aware that there can be buffoons like old Fyodor, you know, and then there can be buffoons like this man who's suffering, the most deeply <laughs> suffering person in the novel.
So we have been made to see varieties of self-punitive measures that people take upon themselves, all the way from this excruciating suffering of Captain Snegirov, then to the deliberate self-injury of Lisa Holokov, the daughter of Madame Holokov, when she slams the door purposely on her finger. And she has a, a disordered imagination. What are we to do with Lisa? See, we're told that Alyosha plans to marry her. And so Alyosha believes in her. We're used to trusting Alyosha. He says she thinks like a martyr. So I think we can't dismiss her. And so all of those perverse imaginings that she has are just that. They're imaginings. Why? Well, we could speculate. She's very bright. She's confined to a wheelchair. She's eager for life. She wants to feel in herself all the range of the human. I remember when I used to read about the saints, you know, that Therese of Lisieux, that innocent little girl that died so young, who said she was the worst sinner in the world. And I used to think, come now. <laughs> Don't brag. <laughs> but I realize, you know, it seems to me, and we see this in Lisa, that the, the eager person, the person who's alive, wants to have experienced not the actual sin, you know, but wants to be part of, of the human race, wants to know what sin is, wants to feel the depths of degradation in oneself. And so it is in her imagination that she wants to do all these terrible things. And Alyosha says she thinks like a martyr. And he does intend to marry her. So according to Dostoevsky, people don't live for their own advantage. They seek something that surmounts their own well-being. And when they can't find it, they seek suffering rather than consolation. So we're made to see the difference in this novel between the neurotic self-laceration of Katerina Ivanovna, you know, that young lady that is so proud and that feels obligated to Dmitri, but she loves Ivan, and the genuine laceration of Lisa. And so with Captain Snegirov, with his suffering, humiliated father, we're made to evaluate the extreme of human behavior, his willingness to be a buffoon, to play the fool for the boys who have come to visit his son. But we're aware of the genuine humiliation, the lacerations that he suffered at the hands of Dmitri, who pulled his beard in public. So one can be a buffoon, Dostoevsky would tell us, either out of selfless love for another person or out of humiliation, or like old Karamazov, out of pride and shame. See, and Father Zosima says to him, you remember at the beginning of the novel, don't be so ashamed of yourself. And he doesn't look like he's ashamed of himself at all. He looks like he's an egotist and bragging. But Captain Snegirov, when his son says to him, when I die, father, get you another boy. And Captain Snegirov says, I don't, and get you a good boy. And Captain Snegirov says, I don't want a good boy. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, and so Kolya says, what did he mean by that? He asks Alyosha, what did he mean by, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem? 
And Agyosha says, well, it's in the Bible. And it means if I forget my dearest thing, you know, may my hand lose its right arm, lose its cunning. So Captain Sneakerelf doesn't want another son at all, of course, because he loves this one. Now, when we next see Alyosha, Ilyusha has died. And did you notice that the miracle that they all demanded for Father Zosima happens to Ilyusha? Quietly. Nobody notices it. We're told at the beginning of the novel that miracles are the result of faith. No, not the other way around. And so we're told very um, inconspicuously that the, the dead boy had been dead almost a week. And strangely enough, there is no odor. See, they didn't embalm corpses in those days. And so there's no odor from his body. So here is our little saint. So the boy has died, and they're gathered for his funeral. Alyosha preaches the famous sermon at the stone. And from being a timid, gentle youth, he's become a powerful apostle of faith. We can see that he's taken on the education of Kodya, who will be the hope of the next generation, a strong, good young man who gives hope of turning out to be what has been sought for so long, a positive hero for Russia. See, see he's got all the strength of a Bazarov, you know, but he's had a teacher. He would have gone the way of Bazarov because he was wrong-headed, he was going after the wrong ideals, but Alyosha teaches him and knows how to teach him, knows how to bring out what's in him. But into this note of hope comes the polyphonic voice of the agony that's also mortal life. The mad mother, where have you taken him away? Where have you taken him? The lunatic cried in a heart-rending voice. So Dostoevsky is not giving us sweetness and light. You know, he's including the pain and the agony. And Nina, too, broke into sobs. Kolya ran out of the room, and the boys followed him. At last, Alyosha, too, went out. And I, listen to what Alyosha says. He says, let them weep. And he says this to Kolya, it's no use trying to comfort them just now. So who does that remind you of? You know, it's Father Zosima again, who says to the woman that's lost her little boy, be not comforted, you know, weep. And see, nowadays people won't let people mourn or grieve at all. It's all as though everybody's just gone to a party. So let them weep, he said to Kolya. It's no use trying to comfort them just now. Let us wait a minute and then go back. No, it's no use. It's awful, Kolya assented. And then he goes on. It's all so strange, Karamazov. Such sorrow. And then pancakes after it. It all seems so unnatural in our religion. So the novel ends with everything gathered Everybody gathered around a stone where Elusha is buried. And so this is the a kind of uh, symbol of the mass. And they're eating the bread, and they're gathered at the stone. They're listening to Alyosha's sermon, in which he emphasizes the power of memory. Now, you know, the narrator at the beginning had told us that one good memory is sufficient to save us. And so Alyosha says, let us not ever forget this boy. And maybe for some of us, this memory will be enough to redeem us if we go astray. Let us always remember how we buried the poor boy at whom we once threw stones. Do you remember? 
we will remember him, boys, all our lives. You must know that there's nothing higher and stronger and more wholesome and good for life in the future than some good memory, especially a memory of childhood, of home. Some good sacred memory preserved from childhood is perhaps the best education. If man carries many such memories with him into life, he's safe to the end of his days. And if one has only one good memory left in one's heart, even that may sometimes be the means of saving us. And the boys are all greatly moved. And Kolya, the little skeptic, you know, now asks a, a question that could be considered naive. But he doesn't mind. He says, Karamaza, can it be true? What's taught us in religion, that we shall all rise again from the dead and shall live and see each other again, all in Yushechka too. And so Alyosha doesn't hem and haul. He doesn't beat around the bush. You remember what Mishkin said when Ippolit said, how shall I die? You know, tell me how to die. And Mishkin says, Forgive us and pass us by. And Alyosha answers directly. Certainly we shall all rise again. Certainly we shall see each other. And shall tell each other with joy and gladness all that's happened. Alyosha answered half laughing, half ecstatic. And the novel ends with the boys planning to go to Alyosha's funeral dinner with Kolya shouting once more rapturously and all the boys chiming in, hurrah for Karamazov. So the novel ends on a joyous note of affirmation, but the joy includes the dark anguish and the suffering of life. As one critic, Robert Blackmer, B-L-A-C-K-M-U-R, has written, he says, let us say that hurrah for Karamazov covers and includes the tragic phrases of the three dreams. The wine of new gladness, the babe, and the devil of the other self. That's the three brothers. And does so under the triple aegis of Zosima's harsh and dreadful thing, which is active love. See, we can't this ending shouldn't make us think that love is easy. We have to remember it. You know, that Zosima says to practice active love is harsh and dreadful. And then Blackmer goes on and says, of Dimitri's beauty of Sodom and of Ivan's wise and dread spirit of destruction. So all of this has been included in this ending. Man is indeed too broad, as Dimitri has declared. But as Father Zosima testifies, love is so powerful that it never fails, that it can work miracles, that it transforms everything, even the suffering that's come about in the world through sin. Now let's go back, as I said we would, to the preface. You remember we read just the first half of the preface together. I said I wanted to save that latter part for when we finish the novel. So the part that's called From the Author, let's read the second half of it. In it, Dostoevsky declares that he has two novels and only one life story. He says the main novel is the second. It's the action of my hero in our day at the very present time. <coughs> of course, the astute reader has long ago decided that I was leading up to this. Still, the reader might say he has forewarned us of something. Having become acquainted with the first tale, the reader will then decide for himself whether it is worth his while attempt the second. I nevertheless give the reader a perfectly legitimate pretext 
to abandon the tale at the novel's first episode. You know, you can abandon it and leave it here. Or are you going to attempt the second, which is the most important? Well, there's the whole foreword, he said. All right, now, our narrator is enigmatic. It's obvious that he's hinting at something. <coughs> he's speaking in riddles, indicating that there's something hidden which he's not revealing. And my interpretation is that he's telling us that we must write the second tale ourselves. Now, your editor, you know, editors love to put footnotes that sound so wise, like they know everything. <laughs> and many times they just make things up. But <laughs> this one tells you that Dostoevsky intended to write a second novel that was a sequel to this. Well, we don't have any evidence of that. And it's my interpretation that he meant this to be his final novel. But that like Prospero and the Tempest, do you remember Prospero and the Tempest? When he addresses the audience, and he says, by the help of your good hands, Prospero says, release me from my bands and get me off this island. And you see, that's what we do with anything we read. If we just drop the book after we've finished it, Prospero stays on that island. He doesn't get into circulation. He doesn't get in your life. And he doesn't get out in the world. And so I think this is Dostoevsky telling us that we must write the second tale ourselves. That what has been made clear in this first novel is the pattern of Christian redemption. We're all sinners of one sort or another. We must all fall to the earth and die, as John says in his gospel. We're all stained with the sin of the fallen human race. One of our fathers is the sensual old Karamazo. And another is the tyrannical Grand Inquisitor. The one we must follow is our spiritual heritage of the saints like Father Sosima. And our work must be to love actively, not just in dreams. So back to what we said at the beginning then. Dostoevsky has given us, in his series of novels, a paradoxical view of human life that includes all of the strange and difficult and peculiar and grotesque, grotesque aspects of life. He doesn't prettify it. But he shows us, you know, by means of all the clues that he gives us, as well as by the action of the novel itself, and finally by its form. See, by this coherent form that the novel has, he shows us that if we do allow ourselves to be crucified, that we can bring forth much fruit. So I'll see you with your papers next Thursday night, and no class but papers. <laughs>